Hi everyone, my name is Thais. I'm the Senior Biomedical Scientist in Blood Transfusion at Barron Valley. And I'm here to talk to you about some case studies, um, three case studies with rare antibodies. So what are we gonna be covering? I'll have, uh, I'll briefly talk about the high frequency antigens and what problems can we encounter uh, case studies will be three. When do we suspect the rare antibodies? What can we do? What is the clinical significance and outcome? So the high frequency antigens are also known as high incidence, high prevalence or public antigens. To be classified as a HFA, it must have an incidence of more than 90%. So if we look down here on this panel, we have 10 cells or 10 individuals. These are each individual phenotype. And the column that has been highlighted is showing a high frequency antigen, the, um, the little k. So as you can see, most cells or most individuals are positive for that antigen apart from cell number four, which we call as having a rare phenotype. So what is the problem with that? There's not really a problem. Um, it only gets problematic when we have a patient that produce an antibody against a high frequency antigen. So the serology becomes very difficult and we can't really um, conclude in the lab as we cannot exclude any clinical significant antibodies and the sample needs should be sent away to a refer reference lab. So our case study number one is a sample that was received from a female patient, 45 year old with a clinical detail of PV bleeding and she came for pre-op assessment as she was going to have a hysterectomy. We had no history on this patient, so we didn't know if she ever received transfusion or if she was ever pregnant. Um, and the antibody screen results were cell so one, two, and three positive to plus reaction. So we started our investigation using NHSBT panel panel one and as you can see here, the IAT results were positive throughout the cells, a two plus, and our enzyme IAT was negative. So what do we do next? Are there any clues on this investigation that could help us to decide what to do? So let's have a look here. This is our first clue. We know some antibodies are resistant and some are sensitive to enzyme-treated cells. Here is our second clue. So our patient autocontrol is negative. So we know this is not an autoantibody. So from here, we know we're dealing with a high-frequency antigen, not an autoantibody, or an antibody against a high-frequency antigen, I should say. So we will send the sample to NHSBT. RCI has done the investigation and they find not specified anti-JMH detected by IAT in the patient plasma. Every time RCI find a rare antibody, they send the sample to IBGRL for confirmation. Here the report from IBGRL. So they confirm the presence of anti-JMH they also um, say here how did they test it. So they done by least two by AT and they also done an enzyme which was negative. They used two examples of JMH negative cells to exclude uh, further antibodies. And they also used two examples of anti-JMH cells to confirm the presence of anti-JMH. They also found that the patient had a weekly DAT positive by leash tube, and they concluded that it was most likely that the patient had an acquired weak JMH phenotype due to the suppression of the JMH. So a bit of background on our JMH. 
So this antigen was named after the first individual that produced the antibody, John Milton Hagen. And the gene was found in the SEMA7 protein, which is believed to play a role in activating T cells and also on the red blood cells. It's not clear, but it's likely to play a role in cell migration and adhesion protein, and it might also be involved as a receptor for the p falciparum. The occurrence of this antigen is 100%, so this is an autoantibody with some exceptions. So an alloantibody uh, is produced um, in uh, JMH positive individuals who red cells express variant forms of the CD108. Anti-JMH reported by the IBGRL in our sample was an acquired weak anti-JMH phenotype due to the suppression of the JMH. Some papers report that this antibody is most often found to be the acquired form and as such can be found in individuals with no prior transfusion or pregnancy. So we have no risk story for this patient, so we don't really know if she's ever been transfused or pregnant. It's not being reported, but it's likely that is a JMH1, which is not clinical significant in transfusion, uh, and so far has not been implicated with any adverse transfusion reaction. However, it's not clinical significant, but it cause problems for us when doing the serology and trying to eliminate any other clinical significant antibodies. There are forms of these antibodies uh, that are clinical significant and this is being described on a paper published in 2014, uh, which is a rare JMH variant type that causes reduced red cell survival. So some uh, of these antibodies uh, are made by JMH variant individuals will not have a positive DAT or a positive autocontrol, as seen on most of individuals with depressed um, JMH antigen. As we can see, um, IBGRL reported most likely due to the suppression of the JMH in our patient, our patient has had a positive DAG by, by tube, but they had a negative positive autocontrol. And just to finish, very little is known about this antibody in pregnancy because most individuals um, that present this antibody are older women or men, which is not really the case for our patient. She was only 45 years old, but she was not an antenatal patient. He has some reference. Oh, sorry. Uh, the carrier, this is the carrier molecule for um, this antigen. And now here are some reference for us. Uh, there's quite a lot in the internet, journals about talking about JMH blood group system. And of course we couldn't um, not look in the blood group antigen facts book. Let's go to our Case study two, from a non-patient this time, the clinical details was that she was pregnant, 10 weeks uh, gestational. Her group in the uh, screen, her screening was positive, so one, two, and three, and she was group AB negative. So we done the investigation, used the NHSBT panel one, and here are the results that we had. So first clue, um, positive panel throughout, two plus. Second clue, our patient's auto negative, so not an auto antibody. And our third clue, there was um, some enhancement when using the enzyme treated cells. So a little bit of background on um, this patient. So we sent it to RCI and they detected uh, aloe antivel uh, by IATN enzyme. As this lady was pregnant, they done a titration there, it could eight, which means is a low risk for HDFN and send the sample to IBGRL. 
This is our report. CyberGRL has performed the phenotype, VEL phenotype on this patient and has found it to be negative. They also confirmed the presence of the anti-VEL in the patient's plasma by LIST2 by 18. They used three examples of VEL negative cells and were able to exclude the presence of further antibodies. And as our patient was um, RHTG negative, we know that she doesn't have an NTD and we can issue the prophylaxis accordingly. So a bit of background, it was reported in 1952 and named after the first antigen negative individual who made antivel. Vel negative red blood cells have been found in one in 4,000 people and approximately in one in 1,500 in regions and Swedes. It's um, classed as IgM and IgG and capable of fixing complemented body temperature. It can be mistaken by a cold antibody. The clinical significance of allo antivel is no too severe in transfusion reaction and positive DAT too severe on a for HDFN. Some references um, in our blood group valve system. And again, our blood group antigen facts book. Our case study three was a known patient with a rare antibody. The clinical details for this patient, um, she was coming for a laparoscopy. Um, Our last case study, case study three, it was a known patient with a rare antibody. The clinical details, she was coming for a lab uh, to do a sterilization and she had a right, high risk of bleeding. The antibody screen was weakly positive on cell two and the rare antibody was not detected on this sample. So we performed an HSBT panel and by IAT and enzyme, and it was completely negative. So what do we do now? So we knew it, she had uh, previously an allo anti-LUB. Um, LUB is part of the Lutheran blood group system, and its frequency is 99.8% LUB positive in the population. Is typed as class IgG and IgM, and its clinical significance is mild to moderate in transfusion reaction and mild on HDFN. Uh, the possible function of this blood group system is adhesion properties and may mediate intracellular signaling. Again, we have some reference here. Please do read more about this antibody, and these are just briefly uh, background on these um, blood group systems. So the outcome, case study one, our anti-JMH patient, RCI has cross-matched the units for us. They selected ABO, DNR, H and K compatible, cross-matched by IAT, and the patient thankfully did not need any blood. Case study two, our anti -vel. There were two wet units available. The units were ABOD and RHNK compatible VEL negative. It was also advised the use of cell savage and thankfully the patient did not need transfusion. And our last case, the anti-LUB. Again, two wet units were available in the country. The units were ABOD and RHNK compatible LUB negative. It was also a device they use a cell salvage and the patient did not need transfusion. So what are we taking away, hopefully? Always look for clues on your antibody identification. I know you might think, well, if I have a panreactive like panel, I just send to a CI and then they will conclude the, the case. Yes, indeed, they will. But it's important for us to, if there is a rare antibody there, that we can suspect. So we can inform the clinicians of possible delays, especially if that patient is in high risk of bleeding 
or near the end of their pregnancy. So you know that if there's a rare, rare antibody there, RBGRL and RCI takes time to confirm these antibodies. And also we don't know if there are units available in the country. So most of the times the autocontrol is negative, while here you can you have a, a pan-reactive like Capano. So this is your your first clue. However, be careful because sometimes this autocontrol can be positive. Always look at the patient background, patient history. It's so important. It will really give you a clue of what possibly could be happening with that patient. As discussed, we know some antibodies are sensitive or resistant by enzyme-treated cells, so it's important that we know our antibodies. If you find an antibody or your colleague find an antibody, go away and read a little bit, every time a little bit more about the antibody and you gain confidence and you improve your antibody identification as well and how we follow up that case. Samples will always need to be sent to RCI as we can't really conclude in-house. Of course, if it's like the case three, our anti-LUB patient, the antibody was not present, so we had enough negative cells there to do our own exclusion. So we didn't need to send the sample to RCI. And it's unlikely to have wet units available in the country. Uh, so we will need a lot of notice to contact um, RCI. They will contact Frozen Blood Bank uh, to find out how many units are available. And depending on the number of units that the clinicians may request, it can take up to eight hours. And remember these units, once um, it's sent to us, the shelf life are only of 72 hours. And if we don't use, it's then wasted. Thank you so much for watching. Hopefully you have taken something away from this presentation. I know this is a complex subject, but it's important that we understand to ensure the best practice to our patients. If you have any questions, then please do send me an email or come and find me. Thank you.